Hello everyone, thank you very much for joining me today. We start a new playlist on JP and Hibernate, a very important subject for any Java developer and something I would recommend any of you learn. Uh, today uh, we will start with the first lesson. As you um, already know, I start from scratch and I build up on several uh, videos. I don't know how many will be at the end, but there will be, of course, a lot of videos in the end in the playlist because JP and Hibernate, uh, they are complex topics. And I want to start by saying that I'm very happy to see a lot of you here already. Thank you very much for being here with me. Remember that if you watch the event live, you can ask the questions in the live chat uh, and start discussions. And I will keep an eye on the live chat as much as possible. Uh, and if you are watching the event live, uh, if you are not watching the event live, you can actually still uh, write your questions in the comment section or you can find me on Twitter and on LinkedIn as usual. So um, we uh, will start with this topic. But before uh, I would like to say that there are some prerequisites. So I want to advise you if you're here, maybe. Uh, for the first time, if you if you recently joined this channel, um, you would benefit if you know first SQL and Java fundamentals, especially uh, JDBC. So without these prerequisites, it might be not so much comfortable for you to dive in into JP and Hibernate. So that's how I'd, I'd like to say that you have. Uh, already a playlist there on Java fundamentals. So in, in case you don't have these prerequisites, advisable for you is to go there, start with those topics and then come back. But I will do my best to go into all the needed details and of course treat this subject as proficiently as possible. And again, keep an eye on the live chat. So if you are watching me live, I'm very happy that I see so many people already here with me today. So let me actually share my screen because um, I will discuss a bit on what JPA is, what Hibernate is, and uh, a common mistake that people starting to learn uh, JPA and any of, of its implementations um, do. And if we discuss this part and everyone, everyone thinks it's clear with that, we can go into, of course, coding because all my lessons are hands-on and that's the most important thing because you are software developers and you need to write codes and that's the main skill you want to learn. Uh, so what I want to say is, uh, first of all, JPA is a specification. So JPA, known today as Jakarta Persistence API, previously known as Java Persistence API, uh, is, is a specification. Um, and not an implementation itself. So when you say we use JPA, when you hear someone saying, hey, we are using JPA in our application, it means that they actually use one of the implementations of this specification. And if you, if you search for the specification, you will find a large PDF document online describing everything about uh, how this specification uh, suggests that an ORM framework should be implemented. So this JPA specification is basically uh, a guideline on how to implement the kind of persistence layer of your application. Uh, so persistent layer deals with uh, persisting data, of course, um, and um, in a, a, a way, in a manner in which we treat entities in the database as objects uh, in our Java application. No, so we know already to think in terms of, of objects and relationships among them. We, we, we've learned that at the uh, Java Fundamentals uh, playlist. You know that from the OOP basics, um, we have the has a and the is a relationship. And basically, that's how we want to think about entities from the database as well when we deal with them in the application. So an ORM framework, and maybe maybe it would be good to actually start writing. No, it's ORM is one of the things that I've, I've said. So our ORM is actually object relational mapping, meaning that you have entities in the database. We discuss now, we only talk about relational databases. Uh, 
this subject only applies to relational databases, so we don't discuss here any kind of NoSQL. So we I just want to make sure that you understand we got rid of that. And object relational mapping, it means that we have relation, relations designed between our objects representing the entities in the database, same as they are in the database. So a first thing that would be uh, essential to understand is uh, the concept of having the object relating with one another and these objects, they represent the entities in the database. So a second uh, abbreviation that I have used that I want to put here for everyone to have it is of course JPA. We said this is the specification, is the um, way, uh, the, a suggestion on how you should implement an ORM framework. So a framework that deals in, in an object relational mapping methodology to allow you allow you implement the persistence of an application and this is jakarta persistence systems api and this was previously known as java persistence api a few years ago um, you might already know the news uh, java ee was uh, external was, was open sourced and then it was um, externalized to, to Eclipse Foundation, if I correctly remember, and then for legal purposes, the name had to be changed from, from Java to something else and the community chose Jakarta. Uh, so that's why now it's called Jakarta Persistence API, but you will still find in a lot of places probably um, Java is being used uh, con continuously. Now, what is Hibernate? Because an another name that you will uh, hear a lot is uh, in, during this playlist is hibernate and sometimes I, I might even refer to as many developers do as java uh, as jpi or hibernate uh, and sometimes I, I will even put them like replaceable one to another uh, they don't are of course the same thing the jpa is the specification hibernate is an implementation of this specification so it's a framework it's the, the dependency that you will add to your application and this dependency is designed in such a way in which it fulfills all the requirements imposed by the JPA specification. In one of the next lessons, I will even go through the uh, specification itself and when I will explain stuff, I will go through the specification and I will show you in the specification document what I want to, um, uh, what, what I mean with those, those things. And one essential thing when learning a, sp uh, a Hibernate uh, and JPA is um, go through the specification and try to understand and uh, keep in mind all, always um, the, the, the real specification, the real document and why those things should be that way. So we, we, we will do that as well. But we need to uh, understand the difference between what JPA is, what ORM is and what Hibernate is. Uh, and the, they are the main topics, main main words, uh, abbreviations or names that I, we will use throughout uh, the, the lessons, this one and the next that uh, will come. So um, I, I said that I, I'm starting first this lesson with telling you about some mistakes that developers do when they start learning or may, maybe even when they use um, JPA implementations such as Hibernate. And one of the mistakes is, of course, because usually the Java developers, they start with uh, the JDK and with learning Java fundamentals, they learn first how to use JDBC. So you know what, what JDBC is, you should, it should be one of the prerequisites of this playlist. Uh, JDBC is Java Database Connectivity, Java Database Connection, some say, is the same thing. So Java Database Connection, and it's the, the vanilla way in which we connect to a, data, to a database management system and send SQL queries. And of course, SQL uh, is one of the uh, things that we consider a prerequisite, a prerequisite for this um, for this course. So, query language. So, query. Yeah. 
forgive me about that. Uh, so uh, one of the one of the things you keep in mind is that you need to know already Java fundamentals, JDB, JDBC, and SQL. Now, considering you you do know those, you might already think about uh, dealing with persistence in a relational database as from your application sending queries uh, to the DBMS. Now my DBMS is the standard cylinder that we uh, we use usually for that. So uh, in case you imagine an application using JDBC, uh, if that application uh, say it uh, it sends an insert and then it sends an update query, you can imagine those as two different queries that have been communicated from your application to the DBMS and the DBMS executed them. So if this is an insert, the, the insert will add something in the database. If this is an update, then the update has been sent to the database. Why is essential to uh, understand from the very beginning that in an ORM and in a JPA implementation especially, this is not necessarily the case. Because when using JDBC, if uh, you sent an insert and then you sent an update, two queries have been executed on the database management system, which is my cylinder here represented. Okay. In case you used uh, a JPA implementation, then the things might work a little bit differently. And that, that's one what we want to learn during or throughout the whole playlist um, that I started today. So in case you send an insert and an update, they are not even they are not even you will not find them as insert and update you will find them as persist and the update operation you will see it doesn't even exist it it will automatically be done uh, at the end but let's let's say that you you think about an insert and an update uh, it might be because they are never executed directly on the database they are executed in what we will call a context okay so this is a context and in this context, like in any other context uh, in frameworks, we uh, have instances of objects. So let's kind of represent these instances of objects like this with some circles. So the instances of objects that can be controlled by the framework, they are in a kind of a collection where the framework sees them and can control them in case of Java via the reflection mechanism. So these are the objects that we call entities. They are inside the context. And when operations are executed with the framework, they are not executed directly uh, in the database management system. They are executed on the context. So there can be situations where um, regardless of the fact that you have uh, executed multiple operations with the context, only part of them are sent as queries to the DBMS. So say you have added an instance, okay, and then you have changed the same instance. There will most likely not be two queries that are sent at the end. The JPA implementation will most likely send only that insert, which will mirror the context, the way the context looks like to the database. Well, things are a lot more complex than this. It was just an example to make things hopefully easier and more um, understandable for a first lesson, but throughout the playlist, you will learn that um, things can happen in multiple ways and depends on the configuration of your, uh, your, your application has. Um, and moreover, sometimes you, and I would, I would recommend developers do that, you might not even uh, know exactly the queries that uh, will be sent. So sometimes you even need to inspect what your uh, app does and which are the queries it sends because sometimes uh, if you don't do that you might misuse the framework and then instead of um, having it help helping you 
with, for example, enhancing the performance and making things easier in terms of the implementation, you will get exactly the opposite. So that those are all things that we need to learn throughout this whole playlist. Then, of course, being that when we discuss about ORM, we discuss about your app working with a context which somehow at the very end magically turns into the persisted data, uh, you will learn with time that it's advisable to have contexts as small as possible. So see, that's why a JPA implementation doesn't actually apply for all the cases. It's not a silver bullet, it's not something that replaces completely JDBC or other solutions. It's a, an excellent framework if you use it for the uh, use cases where it applies well, but if you use it for the use cases where it shouldn't be applied, it will actually, you will actually get the exact opposite. So one other thing that you will learn with this playlist is when to use Hibernate as a framework. It's again, not a silver bullet. And like almost everything in software, uh, you will have to take some consequences and make the right decisions, the, comprom the, the, the right compromises. You should make the right compromises and take the right decisions so that the consequences are uh, good and not bad, okay? So that, that's basically it. Let me see if there are questions in the live chat that I can already answer. Guys, you know, I will skip uh, over the questions that I know they are too early to be answered. So I will answer them throughout the playlist. Otherwise, it would make life impossible for learning. Um, and of course, um, your suggestions, I will keep them in mind. Uh, how commonly JPA is used in the real world. It's actually very common. So uh, even though it is not, as I just said, a framework that applies to everything and not a silver bullet, uh, it is one of the most used frameworks in the Java ecosystem. You will see it uh, very, very often used with, even with very um, highly used frameworks, application frameworks such as Spring. And I'm pretty sure you might have heard of Spring Data, for example. If you've used, if you've heard about Spring Data, Spring Data has a module called Spring Data JPA, which basically behind the scenes uses Hibernate as an implementation. So, um, the, the reason I chose Hibernate because you might you might also wonder, hey, why, why did you choose Hibernate as an implementation and you didn't choose something else? Because Hibernate at the moment is the most used JPA implementation and it's even the convention considered, considered by Spring Boot, which we will also see somewhere at the end of the, uh, of the stream where I will uh, enter also in details about the Spring data and how it uses uh, Hibernate behind the scenes. <coughs> So it is, it is pretty much, it's, it works. It's, it's, I would say a must for any Java developer to learn JPA and Hibernate. Uh, Spring security, I'm not talking about it here. Uh, mention about anti-life cycle, I'm going to do that. I don't think it will be in this lesson, but in one of the next lessons. Um, Transactionization level, levels, uh, I think they will actually, they are all already treated in the spring. So I'm, I'm not sure how much I will deal with them in this playlist. Uh, is that, that's a good question. Is ORM slower than JDBC? I think like for anything else uh, in, uh, in software, the, the right answer is only it depends. If you use it the right way, ORM might be faster. If you use it wrongly, ORM might be slower. So um, to answer your question, you need to learn how to use your ORM framework correctly to make it, to take the best out of it, including the performance. Because if you use it wisely, then it might be even faster by uh, even faster than using JDBC. Why? Because for example, like in my case, my dummy demonstrative case here, uh, instead of sending like two queries, you only send one query okay so it, it it might be um will you also dive into related projects like anverse no i don't think so um okay can an example of some possible negative consequences of choosing hybrid we will deal with those so it's just the first lesson let's let's go slowly please um and again, anti major and the others. Okay, they are they are going to be here uh, later. So uh, now 
if if these are hopefully now things that you you got uh, i would want to say that i have uh, running on my system here on uh, my sql um, i chose my sql just because it's very light but if you wish you want to use postgres oracle microsoft sql server or anything else uh, just do that um, uh, so i will i will use this my sql and of course i also um, uh, i also add the client and and with that being said uh, I'm gonna just create a table because the next thing I'm gonna I'm gonna do here is write some uh, write some code. Start with the first examples of configuring uh, Hibernate, uh, and, and we need to write code for that. So let's create the simplest possible table ever. I will call it product. I will give it an ID which will be the primary key and not null. And I will give it a name, which I will just leave it as the, the default uh, workbench suggests, which is a varchar of 45, meaning a string of variable length uh, between 0 and 45 characters. I will apply. I can see the, the create table here, um, DDL, and I will just consider applying it the way it is. And then, of course, selecting everything from the table, I will get absolutely nothing because this is a table I have just created. So I don't expect to see anything about that. So what we want to do is, first of all, being the first lesson, prove how you execute the first simplest query on such a table. And then, of course, I will have to deal with, with the others. So, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about entities throughout multiple uh, lessons, guys, um, just to set some expectations. I'm not going to talk today about entities and that's it. So the entities will be um, discussed throughout multiple uh, lessons just because they are a large part a very and, and an essential part of understanding Hibernate. So uh, I need I need to create a project. Okay, I, I let let me let me create a new project for that, and it will actually be a, a Maven project, but no Spring, no framework. In this playlist, we solely discuss Hibernate as a JP implementation without any framework. Maybe at the end of the playlist, I will. Uh, to make some some uh, some comparison and, and examples of hibernate usage in frameworks i might use spring to demonstrate that but my uh, opinion is my 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 humble opinion is that any developer needs to know first of all the framework itself without any other framework related to to it in the application so just isolate and understand how hibernate works and then they will be able to use it with any other framework because today i see developers many many developers don't they don't even understand what they use behind the scenes so they use spring data jpa they have no idea that they use hibernate behind the scenes and they have no idea how that works and that's where a lot of issues come come from so the performance problems and even functional problems can result from the fact that I've seen that in the real world re, uh, come, can come as a result of the uh, lack of knowledge and the too much abstraction we have now because now you just put Spring Boot, you have Spring Data JPA, you hear your JPA, hey, I, I use JPA there, but what's JPA? What's Hibernate? What implementation do I actually use? So that's, that's something that you need to know in detail before in my opinion before using spring data jpa for example you, you you would need to know very well what jpa specification states and how uh the implementation you work with works really works like in most cases probably 99 percent of the cases today even more it's hibernate so how do we call that we call it jpa uh c1 uh e1 and uh maybe maybe i would just say 2023 because i know i have a, a, an older playlist and that that playlist i will actually delete at the end when when we finish with this one because this one will be uh probably better anyway and newer so i created a maven project and 
it's the simplest project ever and at the moment it doesn't have anything i'm just going to load it as a maven project and since uh, i just created i should have nothing in pom xml so i can check that and you can see i'm using java 17 which is now the latest long-term supported uh but i need some dependencies you now and the, the first dependency uh you can guess is of course hibernate and where do i take it from so i'm i'm gonna do what i what i do when i when i'm working i'm, I'm ju just gonna search for it and say uh hibernate up uh, to maven dependency okay that's it and i'm gonna take the last version and that should be it so hibernate core copy paste okay and then what else do i need so i'm i'm, I'm using oh this pump here should disappear since i'm using it in an app uh and then what else do i need I, i'm using mysql so call mysql wasn't it like that call mysql my expectation was that it was call mysql but let me let me search for it so um mysql maven dependency okay so it should be something like com mysql the group if i correctly know it's mysql okay and they relocated it to this one which is com mysql yeah so this should be the one so let me let me add it like this and then you will see that i will need a data source so I'm not sure how many of you uh, already remember or, or already know or, or they remember what data source is, but since uh, we will get it at the end, I will I will add the dependency later as well. So what I'm going to do here, so I, I'm, I've added Hibernate, fine, that's I think clear for everyone why I did that. Uh, and I added MySQL because it's the driver, so uh, you know JDBC, so where, where is my board here, so J, JDBC needs a driver no when when we connect and this is part of the prerequisites hopefully so when you use jdbc you use the driver which is basically providing the implementation for the specific vendor you use mysql in my case so i added a driver because in the jdk you only have the contracts you only have the interfaces that java sql package it's only a package of contracts but then all the vendors provide drivers which come with implementations for those contracts and to use any kind of relational database you need to use the right uh, vendor's driver so in my case i had to use uh, mysql so to add a mysql driver to uh, use uh, the database and remember it doesn't matter that you use like hibernate is not a replacement uh, for JDBC, basically somewhere behind the scenes at the end where Hibernate needs to mirror the context to a database, it uses JDBC to send the queries. So it still needs the driver. So that's the reason I added the driver here. So I, I, I need the driver. So let me actually do it like this, reload project to make sure I got uh, my dependencies and then I should be able to, um, uh, to do the, the rest. So what, what do I need now to do is create, um, somehow specify uh, the app how to connect. So to, to do that, I will have, I have two options and I will teach you both of them. And then it doesn't matter regardless of, of which one you use, uh, it will still be the same if you use one or the other. But I, I want to still teach you both of them because I think it's it's still essential to to understand both and and let's let's make the the best out of it. So the first, which is also the uh, the the oldest way of specifying Hibernate, 
or any JP implementation in general, how to connect to a database is using a persist persistence XML file. If you want to use the persistence XML file, you have to add it somewhere in the resources folder in a directory called metainf. So I'm going to create this directory and then inside it, I will create a file which I call persistence XML. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to, because I, I, I will never, and I, I've never kept it in mind, I'm going to like copy the content of this file. Okay. Uh, and the reason is you will basically never have to memorize how to write this XML file. So you will always take it from uh, the, the specification or from the documentations. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is I, I will explain you what I have here. And then we connect to the database and then we execute the simplest operation. We put a product in our table. And then I demonstrate you the, op the other way of connecting without XML. So just with classes, because then you might ask, hey, I have a Spring application. I've never seen a persistence XML in my life. How does that work? How does Spring Boot connect to my application? to my to my database uh, with hibernate since there there is no persistence xml file and you will see that this is a possibility as well that, that i want to cover both of them because it's still possible you see both of them okay um and so let's let's the most important thing you have is the persistence unit the persistence unit has a name which needs to be unique to identify it in case you have multiple, but you will rarely, rarely see that case. Uh, but you need a name for it. So this is, this is the way you will identify it. And then the persistence unit also specifies uh, the transaction type, which uh, is in case you have an independent application resource local, but in case you have something like an application server, it might be JTA. Okay, which means Java Transaction API, meaning you allow someone to externally um, to, to externally manipulate somehow, uh, control uh, the, the transactions of the Hibernate. Then, of course, you have a, a, the description, which is optional. And then you specify the provider, which is kind of the main class of the framework. This is where the... Where the uh, framework logic starts from you can you can imagine it as the main class of the framework so you tell you tell your uh, application hey this is the main class of my jpa implementation and the reason you need to, to, to say to, to to specify this name is you might wonder hey why how how is that the the app doesn't know about it is because again again jpa is a specification there are multiple implementation and if you if you use hibernate you use that org hibernate jpa hibernate persistence provider but if you would use some other implementation such as persist link for example uh, some some uh, eclipse link for example sorry then you would have a different class here you know so that that's why you need to to specify it and then you have uh, all the properties that allow one to connect. So the name of the driver, which in case of MySQL is called MySQL JDBC driver, uh, and the, the uh, path to the database. So it's called MySQL localhost and demo is the name of my database. I will check again just to make sure I, I use, but it's the, the name I usually use for my examples. And then of course the username and the password, which in my case I have, uh, I'm using on my local computer for demonstration purposes, only root without the password. Now, of course, in real world, never use the, the super user root and never uh, put the credentials in clear and never use your user without the password, okay? But uh, for an example, I can do that. And then I, I, if I want to connect, so let me let me connect. Then I, I have to get first of all what, I, what I'm going to to need is an entity manager. It's called an entity manager. So this entity manager is basically what will allow me to control the transactions. For example, begin and commit a transaction. It represents the context. So 
represents the context. So you can imagine is the manager of the, the that collection of objects we call the context that I have this described here. So through the entity manager, you uh, operate on the context. That that's why I I need an entity manager. So the the point, the real point where I need to to uh, get that I need to get is is entity manager because this will allow me to to operate. Um, and to get an entity manager, I need something that's called an entity manager factory. Because in the entity manager factory, as the name suggests, it's a factory pattern designed object to allow me create entity managers when I need them. So we made some more progress. Now, how do you get an entity manager factory? Two ways. If you use a persistence XML file, then you use the persistence class and you provide the name of the persistence unit, which is the one you gave here. So you've given this name yourself in the persistence XML file. And that's it. And normally, this is an application that if I run, I, I should see no errors if everything is uh, it's fine. And it does nothing because uh, there is nothing between the begin and the commit of the transaction. But theoretically, it creates a context. It's an empty context. And since it's an empty context, nothing has to be mirrored. So there will be no operation on the database. But I can see some logs and I can see that's working. So you can see this is now working fine. Now I see no exception, so I can assume it's working fine. And there is no change on the database because, yeah, I did nothing in the end. I just just opened the context and I've closed the context. Normally, I should have actually even said something like close in the end. Close. Okay, something like that. And, and yes, normally, this should have been something like at least try finally. Okay. Anyway. Um, I'm not going to like work on very clean here. I'm, I'm mostly now working on uh, teaching you how to how to use Hibernate. OK, so uh, I have a context. I have an entity manager, uh, so I, I can manage the context. Uh, what do I do next? Well, I have to describe my database, meaning I need to take all the entities in the database and describe them. The entities, and this is where you have to be very careful, they are the tables that represent something um, with characteristics, with attributes. Not all the tables in a database are entities. Because in the database, sometimes we use, for example, joint tables. We use joint tables when we have many to many relationships. A student might have multiple professors. A professor might have multiple students. When you have something like that, you create a table in between. That table is not an entity. That's a joint table. But the student and the professor, they are entities. So what we need to do is to take these entities and describe them as classes in our application. And then once you have the entities, you have to describe separately the relationships between these entities. We will reach in one of the next lessons the discussion about the entities. So going back, I'm going to create a package entities. And I'm going to describe the only entity I have in my database, which is product having two attributes, an ID and the name. So in the entities package, I'm going to create the product class. And to mark it as an entity, to make Hibernate understand this is an entity class, I need to add the entity annotation. You will see that the majority of the, the annotations I'm using, they are coming from the Jakarta space. This is something recent. So in version 6 of Hibernate, Jakarta became the main used space. If you use a prior version, you will see here Java. Java X, sorry. 
it's not a big difference, of course. Uh, you will see the difference in the namings, but most of the things will work the same. At least the fundamentals will work the same. We will now work with the latest, of course, so we will have to deal with the Jakarta names. I have to use standard attributes for the classes for every attribute of the entity, which in case of the database, is a column in the table. So I can say something like private long ID, private string name, because I remember that uh, I designed the ID in the table as an integer value and the name as a varchar of 45, meaning a string. Um, so that should be it. And then it's mandatory to mark the uh, primary key using the ID annotation. There are cases where a table in a relation database doesn't have an ID or has a complex ID. We will talk about those cases later in one of the next lessons. But now we will start with the simplest case where you have only this product, the ID, one field, is the primary key and then you have one more field as a name and i'm going to just add here the getters and the setters and that's the simplest probably entity that i could design now having the product what i'm going to do is create an instance set an id for it and then set a name for it and then use the entity manager to tell the app what we want to do with this new instance in my case add this to the context i want to be very explicit and again make sure i, I repeat myself persist is not an insert so this is not an insert query. Okay. Remember, you have to change your mind, change your thinking from the JDBC philosophy to the ORM philosophy. The persist might end up as an insert or might not. For example, if I will add a remove from the context right after and I would remove the entity you might end up again without any query so you see you don't know for sure if the persist will end up or not now of course you you know for sure because you you see that it's it's a small app but in a real world app you might have business logic so a persist is just add a new instance of an entity in the context if nothing happens and it's still a new entity in the context at the end of the transaction, it will end up as becoming an insert because at the end of the transaction, when we commit the changes, the context is mirrored to the database. So the app makes sure that the context, the changes we made throughout the process will become persistent in the database. We usually, we don't care about that too much but we need to understand how the framework works so now if everything works fine i'm running the app and the next thing will happen is that uh, this uh, new instance will be persisted first in the context and then at the very end this will become an insert in the database and then i should be able to see it as a record in my table so everything ended up and now if I'm going back to my table here, here's my beer. So the beer really became part of the context. See, um, that's the easiest, the easiest thing we can do. Now, before going further and explaining you the programmatic approach of um, connecting to the database with Hibernate without using the persistence XML file, I will uh, read again uh, some of your questions and see if I can answer any. 
So examples from Spring Team uses Spring Data JDBC, would you recommend that over JPA? So Newton, JDBC and JPA, they are different technologies, both of them having different uh, different good and different bad things. When you choose a technology, you choose that technology uh, counting the consequences and making the right compromise. That's what a software architect does. Uh, Spring Data JDBC is not better than Spring Data JPA and Spring Data JPA is not better than Spring Data JDBC. You will simply choose one or the other depending on what you do, what your application does, and of course the business context around. Uh, they are two different technologies and both of them are good if used at the appropriate case. Uh, query DSL is not part of Hibernate, so no, we will not cover that. We will query, we will uh, cover, however, criteria query, which is similar. Um, SACA pattern is something architecture not related to Hibernate and not to any persistent technology. It's just a way of implementing distributed transactions. No, we won't deal with that. Microservices, again, uh, something not related to today's. Um, I thought you added Hibernate dependency. Why is the entity annotations from my uh, JPA instead of ORG Hibernate? Because uh, be that, that's actually a very good question. So very good question. So the question is, why is entity from Jakarta and not from Hibernate? Well, Hibernate is JPA implementation. Remember, JPA is the specification. It also comes, and that's maybe something I forgot to tell at the, at the beginning. It also comes with uh, a part of uh, the, the contract, some, some contracts, some classes like the entity manager, the entity manager factory, and the annotations. They are part of the specification as well. And Hibernate implements that specification. So makes us able to use the standard objects and contracts from the specification with the implementation of Hibernate behind the scenes. I hope that that clarifies and thank you very much. A very good question. Okay. Um, can you explain in short, what do you mean by ORM and what do you mean by entity? ORM is, again, going back, object relational mapping. It's the philosophy in which a framework uses objects and relationship among them when creating the persistent logic for your application. While uh, an entity, as I suggested a bit earlier, is anything from the database that represents, that has attributes and characteristics. It's basically the tables in the database without the join tables. So anything anything that models data to be persisted in the database. Okay, displaying the question, that's a good point. I will see how to do that. Um, cool. Um, so it's it's working, yeah? So I, I, I've only used uh, I've only used Hibernate, MySQL, and it's working. And I, I managed to to use the person XML. What what if we don't want to use an, an XML file? And I think that that's the last topic for today's lesson. Uh, what if we don't want to use the XML file? We can implement a programmatic approach. So let's say create uh, a package persistence. And then one of the things that I need to add, and I think the only the only thing I, that I need to add actually is a model of all this, meaning a class to represent this. So replacing all the XML file with one class. And this is called a persistent unit info. And I can simply call my implementation custom persistence unit info. So I have to implement the contract persistence unit info, which is an interface uh, known by 
Hibernate, actually known by the JP implementations. And that will be used to replace the way in which the, the PrestaXML file is taken. So now I'm going, of course, to override all the methods. And there are many, but don't get scared about it. We will only need to implement a part of them. But what you will see is that all these many methods, they are each one of them actually just a replacement of something that you had here in the persistence XML file. So instead of a persistence unit name, I'm going to just copy the name from here. Um, the instead of provider class name, I will just copy the provider from here. Transaction type, JTA or resource local, like depending on what you use, but being that we don't use a container, uh, an application server container, we I basically use resource local. Um, and here is the data source. So now, now I'm a little bit into trouble because I don't have a data source out of the box. So I think Hibernate creates its internal implementation because I didn't need any when I had to. So I, I just had to provide the properties, and then then Hibernate did something with them. But in my case now, well, I, I'm not sure if I really have any data source already. Uh, coming with um, with Hibernate, but uh, I will use the best data source ever, Hikari Connection Pool. So Hikari is probably the best data source you can use today. It's also the convention in many frameworks, such as, for example, Spring Boot uh, considers, but for that one, I will need to uh, search for its dependencies. So let me do that. Say Hikari, no, sorry, Hikari Kupu data source. Okay, and this is the official uh, GitHub of Hikari. And somewhere here it tells us that for versions above Java 11, we can use the latest version of Hikari 5.0.1. So I'm going to copy it in my POM XML. I'm going to reload the project. And I'm going to use this Hikari here. Hmm. Let me try again, reload the project. Because this should be Hikari. Data source or something like that. Um, let me check, but I don't think I've forgotten that, did I? It should seem to be Hikari. Hikari data source, yeah. Hmm. In my IntelliJ, sometimes doesn't want to cooperate with me. Oh, now it works. Okay, and of course, the only things I need to specify are exactly the same that I have specified in the persistence XML files. So that means the, the URL, the username. And yes, the same observation here, never part code, usernames and passwords and, and URLs. This is just for demonstration purposes here. Okay. And then what else do I need for managed cloud? This, this is a, an important one. So 
in case you i don't think it works like without i i i don't think it works i, I didn't try it but um usually to allow your app manipulate the entities through reflection you have to uh specify them here so I'm, I'm gonna do that i will check that that afterwards if it works without or not but i'm pretty much sure that if, if you don't specify them in clear here uh, all your entities um then it, it might not work and then anything else that we might need probably not okay so that's that's the minimal the minimal uh description of an a persistence unit through code and now, instead of using the file, which was, remember here, we created the, the anti manager factory uh, through, through the file itself. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is just, just comment this out. And I'm still going to get an anti manager factory. But instead, I'm just going to say, I want to use a hibernate persistent provider and create a container entity manager factory using the instance or an instance of the persistence unit the way I created it. And then you have a second parameter here that you can use to provide properties, but we can leave it empty. And I can run this. If I run it, I will probably get into trouble because I cannot just add two objects with the same uh, primary key value primary key has to be unique but i can change it in fact i can change both of them if you want and then i can run it again to prove that this works similarly and now it will be your decision in your app whether you want to use the persistence xml or you want to use uh, the, the code, the, the programmatic way of connecting, that, that would be fine. Oh, it actually tells me that it didn't find example entities product. Example. That's interesting. Mm. Very strange. Should I give it another try? Maybe it didn't compile prior so it I'm gonna check it here. Okay. Manage class names. Example entities. entities. Oh, entities. Come on. Okay. Sorry. My mistake, it was one letter missing there. That's why it didn't find it. So running again. Um, yeah, and um, we didn't discuss about too many things, no, did we? So we, we simply proved how to connect and how to create the entity manager, which, which manages the context. So we, we have a long way, actually, uh, until we will be able to say that we know JP and Hibernate very well, but we made good progress and we managed to like connect and find out how to connect in two different ways. Uh, and we discussed also a bit about the philosophy uh, of an ORM, object relational mapping, this kind of methodology, um, uh, the, the JP specification has been created for uh, and some of the things that, that we need to consider when thinking in an ORM methodology and not in a, in a JDBC one. So um, with that being said, I'm, I'm uh, looking at my clock here and we are almost uh, at the end. So I'm, I'm just going to read once more through the questions and see if I can answer any of them. And then we will close for today, but next time uh, we will continue our discussion and we will uh, deal with more entities and, of course, their life cycles as well. So let me go once more through the questions. Um, where were I? Um, can we explain in short doing by Warm? I, I already did that. And then merge. Uh, we will discuss about merge, persist, remove, uh, and the others uh, probably in one of the next lessons. 
um, the question themselves what account use case is to avoid using JPA so that's a good question uh, uh, just shortly because we don't have the time about the long discussions uh, I would say if you find yourself having to retrieve a lot of data from the database um, usually say using a schedule process or something like that then JPA, a JPA implementation might not be what you are looking for. Uh, you would preferably avoid using a JPA implementation if you have to deal with a lot of instances because you know what happens now. So everything is dealt as objects in this context. Operations are applied on the instances. If you have a large context, then performance will be affected. But throughout the playlist, you will find out more details about this and why. Um, and then, hash code equals methods are required to be overwritten. Uh, yes, they are usually. Uh, we skipped over those now because in our example, like it literally didn't make any difference if we created them or not. But once we deal with select queries, then having uh, properly implemented equals and hash code is essential. And that's something we will do next time. What about the session factor and its relation with Hibernate? Session factory is, uh, I will go into that discussion next uh, next time because it's a long story. So uh, session factory is not part of the JPA. It's part of, of, the, um, of the, the Hibernate as a framework. And basically you are using it now. Anti-manager factory is just somehow of, in, in case of Hibernate an adapter to JPA for the session factory itself so instead of using session factory directly which is the hibernate way a direct hibernate way of doing it you indirectly use the anti-manager factory contract which is the specification way of doing that but maybe we'll see that more in detail in the future um why are we passing the hash map it is basically a way in which you can you can uh, provide different parameters but in our case, it's just an empty hash map because being the simplest example, there are no parameters that, that I wanted to send, okay? But in the future, you will learn that there are specific parameters you want to add. And then to add them, you might want, uh, you, you in that, that second way of doing things, you will add them through, uh, through that hash map, okay? In person we did not show the path of the entity. Uh, that's true, I didn't. Uh, again, it might work without actually, but uh, with this exclude unlisted classes, I think it's, it's uh, basically uh, why it doesn't complain because I didn't add uh, normally. Otherwise I should have had something like that, class, class, and then specify all the classes I need. Okay. Uh, briefly on to choose again I already talked about that and uh, the last question is this the only way to create anti manager factory through Java or does it have multiple ways so there are different ways of implementing that throughout the time uh, the one that I know now as being the the most used and the recommended is this one and honestly I don't know any other that I would, would be able to tell you to use um other than this one so i would say yes take this now as being the only way to to create programmatically um and yeah normally normally you will not like hard code things like i did here no you will read them from somewhere and then you will simply set them on this object you create that might have attributes that's something i didn't show but if you want i can do next time uh so no never actually never hard code things okay if that's the question i did this was just to make it fast now and easy for our demonstration purpose but you can just use it as a normal instance you can set attributes read it from a file read it from somewhere from an endpoint read it from from somewhere so all these details you can read them from somewhere and then uh, once you have the instance you just set it this way i have done it here in real world apps where are the database name and password stored 
the database name can be stored in any application properties file uh, or environment variable uh, while the secrets uh, they should always be somewhere in a vault from where they get injected usually in environment variables uh, during the deployment process so uh, keep anything that can change with the environment in properties and keep every secrets in vaults or software that's specially designed to securely protect the credentials okay we are over the time and with that being said i would like to uh, end up here and um, of course ending up by thank saying again thank you for being here i'm very very uh, impressed uh, of the, the large number of, of people that has joined this first lesson and I hope that you will join me again in the next one uh, with even more um, hands-on examples and questions and, and demonstrations. Uh, thank you very much everyone. Like usual, I wish you an excellent time and of course an excellent time for studying. Cheers and goodbye.